Let me tell you a little bit. I'm John Toole, uh, Executive Director and CEO of the Computer History Museum, and that is our official name now for those of you that, that, that haven't known that we've changed it, and we've also changed our, our logo into a wonderful logo that you, you hopefully you've seen. I want to give you just a few minutes of, of who we are and where we're going and what we're all about. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to meet a lot of new people. I think our roots, you know, really go back over 20 years ago. Uh, Gordon and Gwen Beller here, some of the original founders back from, from the Boston days. Uh, the Boston Museum, is, of course, is now closed, and we chose to come to Silicon Valley as a, as a means that really had where the technology was really coming from. Len Schustick, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, who is also here, is one of the, certainly the, the major proponents and founders uh, of the Silicon Valley uh, effort that we've really been pushing very, very difficult, very, very hard for a long period of time. It's been an exciting road for the last several years. In 96, the collection moved out here. And we really have a very important mission to preserve the artifacts and stories of the information age, something that really, surprisingly to all of us, isn't really being done across the world. And it's an unusual opportunity for us to really take that cross and really tell that story of information technology and to preserve it in a very meaningful and substantial way. Our really collection is not only what you saw in our Building 126 uh, of a lot of the artifacts uh, in computers, but we've got videotapes, uh, films, photographs, documentation, and software, all of which we, our goal is to really put this together in a very powerful and compelling way to, to really chronicle what history, computer history particularly, is all about and how this can reach and impact many of us and really tell the story in substantial ways, some of which you're going to see this evening. That's why we're videotaping this tonight, because this will become part of our public record as, as we go forward. We have really a world-class collection, in fact, uh, probably the envy of many of the institutions around the world. In fact, we've, we've made tours around the world and have established important relationships with different organizations. Uh, software, hardware, robotics, artifacts. Uh, this is a picture, of course, of what you've seen over in, in the uh, warehouse, our visible storage exhibit area. This isn't our museum yet. Uh, if anything, we could call this our alpha building because we'll tell you a little bit about what a beta building may start to look like and ultimately what our permanent home hopefully will, will start to look like in the future. Um, it's a way in which you can get to see the artifacts up close and personal and really see by comparative analysis what impact this has had on history. And we've had dose and lead tours. Uh, you can see what's going on uh, from the kitchen computer, which is shown in this one, to an IBM 31691 in this picture, to down memory lane at the very end, Gene Amdahl's whisk machine, which I hope many of you had an opportunity to see. Um, many of our artifacts turn out to be things that are really one of a kind. The Joniak machine, uh, John von Neumann architecture that was built by Rand Corporation that was really almost lost. So you've probably read about this in the New York Times in the Wall Street Journal articles that have been done on us. Um, it turned out to be put in boxes at the LA County Museum. Well, almost lost. Uh, fortunately, they, uh, Keith Ungerfer and a couple of in Willis Ware found, saw it and actually in the back end of the museum called, I think, Gwen at the time. Gwen can verify that actual story. Uh, they shipped the things up to Boston. They completely sent a team up there and put it together, and it, it remains in our collection. This plus many other things become part way, important ways in which we can actually preserve the artifacts and those stories of the people that really made these things happen over time. Uh, the Crays, the comparative, see a Cray 1, a Cray 2, and what Seymour Cray really had in design from a technology viewpoint to a personal viewpoint. And I think that's one really unique advantage that we have and we can really give to people uh, that most people uh, you cannot see anywhere in the world. Um, the PC wall, um, you know, looking across time from the 70s uh, to the present. Um, one of the most common things that I've, I've heard from people that sort of visit us is, gee, I've really used an awful lot of those kind of machines in there. Um, that makes them very nervous because then they think they're history. <laughs> and that was Vin Cerf's line, of course, when he accepted the Fellows Award. Um, the reality is 
all of computing has really touched us all in different ways. And I think the, the PCs, whether it be PCs, Palm Pilots, which you're going to hear, and the story of where that really came from and emerged from, have, have really changed the way we think, live, do business, interact with our families, interact with our business partners. And I think this whole idea of, of chronicling this, the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly, um, if you will, of the things that go on is really part of our mission that we really try to really make so dear. Um, some of the Innovation 101, a special exhibit which has been in our visible storage area that we did jointly with the Intel Museum for the Science and Engineering Fair, is perhaps one step closer to a museum-like experience where you can see the artifacts, some of the pictures, and you're going to see more and more of this over time as we get closer and closer to some of our permanent home and hopefully some of our cyber homes, which we are really dramatically trying to go forward with in our cyber museum. People make it happen. Um, all of you, we really want you to join us if you haven't already in every way, shape, or form as volunteers, as supporters. But the board is phenomenal. It's one of the things that attracted me to come here. I've been here about a year and a half, two years. feels like 20 decades. Um, but it's been, a, been an exciting time for me, and, and it really is so multidimensional, the kind of things and experiences that, that I can have and I can share, and hopefully our whole organization is really committed to make it happen. Uh, our volunteers, uh, many of the docents you saw this evening were, were just volunteers. You'll see more of those tonight that are really helping us make the community that this particular museum, I think, can touch the hearts and souls, not just in the valley, but to be part of it, uh, but across the United States and across the world. And I think that's what our, what our overall goal happens to be, because we are an international museum. Uh, we have parts of an international collection, and we are rapidly continuing that collection as time goes on. One of our plans of records, of course, is, is our being part of the NASA Research Park. And I want, to, I want to just show you a little bit about where we're going, uh, what the plan could be to develop this, this goal of a, of a government, nonprofit, commercial, university complex. The big hangar is, is, is airmarked right now, is a historic mon monument. It will become an air and space center with a focus on forward, future-looking space activity. Uh, of the future. They will not be a collecting museum, the, the, the goal is to be, able to be able to describe the vision of what space exploration in the future may look like. Really in front of that, on the south side, as, as you see it, um, is, is three acres of land that is, is our parcel of land that we're, we are planning on, uh, we, one of our plans of record is to really build a permanent building up there. Across the street from that is a, is a university complex which is intended to be developed over periods of, of time. And south of that, uh, further, will be a complex by Lockheed Martin, um, a, actually a Sagan Space, an aerospace group, and an astrobiology building. It'll, it'll appear uh, in its form down there. This will happen over, which we would like to be really sure of, you know, 5, 10, 15 years period of time. And our aggressive, really, part of it is really to build 120,000 square foot uh, building on three acres of land, break ground in 2003 and be operational in 2005. And clearly our goal is, is to move out quickly. And we are in the process of trying to really move forward as rapidly as we can because we have a world-class collection and we want to be able to put this on exhibition both in cyberspace as well as physical space. We picked our architect and we've got about oh, a month and a half left in our schematic design phase. Uh, some of you may have already seen some of the, the plans of where that is, is going to be going. Um, we have on record something we're calling a beta building because 2005, 2006 may actually be a long period of time. So we've got to exist between then and now. Uh, so there's about a 40,000 square foot uh, building that we're trying to think through of where that is going to be, a, be, a, be placed and put at, at NASA right now. Um, but 25,000 square feet of warehouse, 10,000 of, of uh, administrative space, and some other area that we can actually do some, some events on. Um, that's, a, that's a view of kind of where our, the site would be uh, from, from uh, looking up toward the hangar. Uh, this is a picture of what a concept may be of what our beta building may, may start to look like. Um, and this may be actually be, we're going have to have some place in which we can reside, certainly before the end of the calendar year. This is uh, kind of what 2005 might start to look like with some of the architectural rend renderings that, that come forward. 
Um, I, I've got to admit that I've got an awful lot of pressure this evening uh, of what this kind of uh, architecture design may actually look like, particularly with the group that is in front of us today. So they really wanted to do something more creative. <laughs> and and we, we tried to place this in the right place that would happen, okay? Um, but um, I think the FAA said no earlier because of the antenna. Um, but, but as far as the building design, it's really great. I mean, <laughs> We have a great public set of programs. Um, we have had unbelievable lecture series last year. Uh, we've got a, few, a lot of things coming up. I'll give you, show you the list in, in a moment. And some major events, from a Fellows Award to, to uh, Deck World 2001, as one example of an event where we've had almost major reunions coupled to really recording what made those companies great. What were the things about them? What were the personal stories? And that becomes part of our archive and things that we can do for that in the future. And of course, our upcoming lecture series, um, Doug Engelbart, after, after tonight, which I'll introduce those folks in a moment, uh, Doug Engelbart, Charlie Bachman, Carver Mead, Al Shugart, Bill Asprey, just to mention a few, and more will be added over time as our lecture series progresses. Um, so that's a really important one. So let me, let me, um, close this a little bit about please help us get involved, spread the word. Uh, we're little known in general, uh, kind of across the board. Um, we're the, sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of its content and I think uh, the expectations uh, are, are phenomenal and I think you're going to see more and more over the next couple of years that are really, really make a difference. Volunteering is really important to us, the, the, the base for anything. If you want to help us raise money, if you want to help us uh, do particular tasks, become a docent, those, all those tasks become really important to us in terms of our manpower and our, and our limited process that we have. And certainly, last but not least, is become a supporter. Um, this does take money to run an operation, uh, and it really, we these kind of public lectures, free uh, that they are, can only be supported with, with your help and support. And I want to thank everyone here this evening, particularly because there are a lot of supporters in the audience tonight. And it's, it's really each and every one of you that has made these kind of events really seriously possible. So without too much further ado, I wanted to, to introduce really our speakers tonight and give them the opportunity to, uh, to really tell the whole story. I mean, there's an incredible, credible team that you're seeing before your eyes this evening, uh, many of which um, you may know, many of which you may not know. So let me, let me run through just a few little highlights, and I'll try to be a little bit personal in a couple of these. Jeff Hawkins, okay? Jeff Hawkins is sort of the inventor of the POM, okay? Um, he's, he's really been one of the co-founders of Handspring with Donna, who's sitting right next to him, of course. But really, the quality of the engineering and his ideas, uh, you're going to really enjoy this evening. I'm not going to give you, read to you the, the typical bio, because I think these are the kind of people, each of which have their own way in which they express themselves. And it takes about two minutes before you're going to understand exactly where they come from and how they've done. But he goes way back from, from early days at Palm, early days at Grid. He's one of us, so to speak, and I think he's kind of revolutionized with his vision of things in the future, and that's what he's tried to capture, and I think we're going to hear about that this evening. Donna Dubinsky. Uh, Donna, of course, was another co-founder of Handspring with Jeff in 1998, okay? Um, she was uh, president and CEO of, of Palm Computing, and, and of course, maybe one of her most important credentials in my point of view, of course, is she's on our board of trustees. Um, but she's a real fire plug and really knows how to make things happen. And I think you're going to understand that also when you listen to, to Donna and where she really comes from and what her contribution has been to the whole realm of things. Ed Colligan. Ed has certainly had been all kinds of uh, background as vice president of marketing for Palm Computing. Um, a real wizard at the marketing ends of things and really fits together as part of this team as a real motivator. And I think you're going to see some of his stories that will come through uh, very clearly this evening. And, and of course, what made all this happen? We're, we're very, very fortunate to have Andrea Buter, who wrote a book, is a, a co-author of one of the books, okay, that, that I think some of you have already have copies of. 
but really has been involved in the marketing ends of things for a long period of time and was really the person in, in the spark plug that really pulled a lot of this together to really document this in the story. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Andrea, who will then be able to care, take it on and, and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Well, let me start the um, evening off by being indiscreet and telling you a, a little secret about Jeff Hawkins. Jeff squirms when you call him a visionary. <laughs> it makes him think he ought to be sitting here with these purple robes, a turban, gazing into a crystal ball. Nevertheless, a lot of people often call him a visionary, and he really is. Um, so I'm going to infringe a little on his turf by making a prediction. I really think we're all in for a very enjoyable evening. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we are really all in for a very enjoyable evening by listening to Jeff, Don, and, and Ed tell their story, because it really is their story. In 1996, this seems an eternity ago, um, these three people here, um, and the just 30 people who worked for them at Palm Computing introduced a, the pilot, a handheld, tiny organizer computer that could connect to the PC. And the rest is history, so to speak. Um, since then, the handhelds have just become part of everyday life in an unbelievable way. And probably many of you came here because you had the instruction on how to get to Moffett Field in it, or at least a date for the evening. And that all might make you feel like this was a slam dunk. But really the road to success for these three people was rather rocky. And it started in 1991 with Jeff Hawkins. Jeff, good evening. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> Um, in 1991, you were designing uh, laptop-sized pen computers at a company called Grid um, for uh, really industrial markets. How did that evolve into palm computing a year later? Yeah, so that's right. I was uh, at Grid almost from 82 to, uh, to the end of 91. And I, we won't cover all that story, but I was doing the Grid pen, which we brought one here. I think you've got one here. And the Grid pen is just like an, in the back right corner there. Gridpad is sort of a overgrown Palm Pilot. So, so this is uh, this is it here, and it was just one of the first products with a stylus on it. So you could, it didn't have a keyboard, and we were selling this to uh, to vertical markets. People are using them for like truck delivery drivers. One of our b biggest accounts was Thomas's English muffins. So <laughs> those guys would go around at 4 a.m. and they'd start delivering the muffins, and they were using this to sort of keep track of it. Well, a few of them were. And we were having some success with this product, and, and it's now kind of humorous to look at it. But back in those days, people really got excited about this. And they would love it, and, I, you know, and, and I'd ask them what they like about it, and then they'd say, you know, if you could make a smaller one that, that I could carry in my pocket and it wouldn't be too expensive, and I could use it for personal things, that would be great. And I didn't think that at that time it wasn't really possible. Uh, it just wasn't possible to make this inexpensive and small. But that idea stuck in my mind, and eventually I, I got the bug to say, all right, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to make a small, and, and then the whole thing kind of cascaded. You sort of got the idea, oh, all computers are going to be small. They're all going to be portable. That's the way it's going to be in the future. And, and let's start down the path to try to get there. So you founded Palm Computing, but I think once told, you told me you didn't really want to found a company. No, uh, starting companies is a lot of work, and that's uh, it's not something I want to do or ever want to do again, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Even though Ed and Donna do most of the work, um, it's still a, a problem. Uh, but, but I kind of backed into it because I wanted to build this little computer and then some venture capitalists found out about it and they said, why don't you start a company? And I said, really? They said, yes, we'll give you money. And I said, really? You really want to do that? And uh, I was playing really hard to get, uh, legitimately. And uh, they sort of convinced me that, yeah, we, we should start a business to do this and um, you know, make it a software business. We'll give you the money and we'll get started on it. So I said, okay. We'll do it. But, but it was really the goal was to build a handheld. I wanted to build what we now call as a PDA or a POM or whatever. But I wanted to build that, and I was trying to find any way to do it. And it just turned out that the way to do it was to start a company and try to build a, you know, build a product. And you had a very specific idea, I think, and I'm holding the fruits of that idea in my hands. Do you want to talk about sure, it? Sure. This, this is our first product, and, and I'll take all the blame for its failures and... and uh, because it was a terrible failure. This was, <laughs> this was like the Zoomer. It's sort of big, Jack. Yeah, it is sort of big. 
We actually thought this was really cool at one point in time. <laughs> this was um, the Casio and the Tandy Zoomer, which we, uh, which we started Palm with the idea we're going to build a product like this, and then we ended up partnering with Tandy and Casio and others, GeoWorks, AOL, Intuit. I think that's the total crew there, right? It was uh, completely misnamed. Right? Completely misnamed. It was the opposite, the antithesis of a Zoomer. <laughs> <laughs> it was a slow fact that the story, the story goes that the, the code, that was a code name that came up, the rhyme was consumer. And then Tandy liked it so much they changed it into the product name, and it was a really bad product name, too. So anyway, this was the first product of a consortium of companies of which Palm Computing created the, the, the main application suite for this. And this is how I was able to attract Donna, and Donna was able to attract Ed to come here because they were excited about this, too. <laughs> we hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> they hadn't seen it yet. But it, I told a good story, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, Donna, Jeff just admitted that he really needed someone to run his company. Um, so that makes it clear why he won't want to hire you. But what did you see in Jeff and his little crew of seven engineers that made you want to work there? She hadn't seen this yet. We know that. Was <laughs> <laughs> well, I had been out uh, looking for a job and looking for a great opportunity to help build a company in Silicon Valley. And I wanted to do something significant. And I was seeing all these opportunities that were just dreadfully boring, you know, some uh, network security thing or something that I couldn't understand. And um, I, I really, you know, I'd been a part of Apple for 10 years and a part of trying to take personal computing tools and make them available to broader and broader audiences. And when I heard about Jeff and met, met Jeff and found out what he was doing, I, I immediately felt that this was the next generation of computing. What he showed me was actually a little device from Sony, littler than that one. No, it was about the same as <clears> that one. <throat> okay. Your memory stays all the time. <laughs> and uh, it was called the Sony Palm Top, and it was a um, stylus-based uh, small computer. It was in Japan only. And as soon as I saw it, I, I really felt like he's on to something. This is the next generation of computing, truly mobile computing that goes with you everywhere. And I, I uh, thought to myself, this is the first opportunity I've seen that is, that is really exciting. It's really big and it's, it's significant. It's about changing the world. You know, one of the things all of us from Apple came away with was this sense that we were changing the world. And I wanted an opportunity to do that again. So uh, this seemed like a, a really great opportunity to do that. And then I started, you know, checking out Jeff and sort of making some calls on him and, and who he was. And, found out he was a, a pretty good product person, a little stubborn from time to time, but a pretty good product person. And, <laughs> and um, I just felt like there was, there was a good match there in terms of our skill sets, because uh, I was somebody with a lot of business experience, but wasn't a product um, designer or product person at all. So I was really looking to team up with somebody who had the product side of it. So that was in 1992, and at the time, there was a lot of hype about something back then called the pen computing market. Jeff, do you want to talk about that at all, the companies that were trying to make it? Well, the pen computing market started actually, that started, you know, around the time we introduced the grid pad, then there was uh, Go Corporation, and then there was Momenta, and there was the pen point operating system, and there was a whole series of pen-based computing companies. Uh, by the time we started uh, Palm, or we were into Palm, you know, here's the, the EO, that was sort of in the class of those things. The Ross Perot of computers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but anyway, by, that was the first wave of pen computing. Uh, it, it, a lot of momentum and, and excitement about that. But the time we were get working on the, on the Zoomer, then that first wave was kind of fading already, I think, wasn't it? It was kind of peaked already. And the, and the PDA thing was coming up. That was the Apple Newton. That was going to be the next big thing. Um, and that, that was, it, it, there's been a continuous wave of sort of excitement about mobile computing and most of which did not pan out. As See, the Newton's bigger than the Zoomer. The Newton's bigger than the Zoomer. <laughs> it wasn't much faster either. <laughs> um, so, but you know, there was there was a tremendous excitement. People believed back in that time that the keyboard was going to go away, and everybody in the future would be interfacing their computers with a stylus and writing and taking notes and handwritten faxes and things like this. And that was that was the the future. The keyboard was dead. Long live the pen. Uh, we never believed that. I didn't believe that. I always said the pen, you know, Go's motto was the pen is the point. And I used to say, no, it's not the point at all. The, pen, the point is mobility and it's small size and the pen just happens to be an interface tool, uh, which was a little bit more close to, to accurate. But there was a huge hype about pen. There was pen computing conferences. 
pen computing newsletters and magazines and everything else that went along with it. A little earlier, you said that um, when you were at Great and customers asked for a smaller computer, you couldn't really make that happen yet. Were by 1993, 92, when you made the Zoom, the technologies in place? Yeah, they were more in place. You know, obviously, they weren't in place enough because those early products had failed. So mm -hmm. partly, you know, a lot of to our poor understanding of the design of them, but also because it was still expensive and it was still large. It, you know, I think technology always marches forward, and there's some point, an inflection point, where the technology matches up uh, where you, with, with the, some market needs or market demands, and, and that's when something really takes off. So we might have been a little premature. You see the failures of the early PDAs, the General Magic, the Zoomer, the Newton. Those products all failed. Uh, and, and it wasn't until, you know, I, I think what, what led to the success of Palm is that everyone else gave up. That was, uh, that was our secret to success. And I, I, I really mean that. I'm not joking about that. I, everyone really gave up. And that, that's what made it uh, possible for us to succeed, but it also made it difficult for us to succeed because everyone assumed that we should give up as well. And that, you know, we, were, had to, we just were dumb. <laughs> but we kept trying at it. But it did kind of, the technology kind of caught up to it. And, you know, now it's just on a roll, and it's amazing what's happening today in mobile computing. So, Donna, um, Jeff suckered you into the company by showing you a great demo. And then when you arrived at Palm, what was the real situation? Well, I was pretty excited, be, you know, before I got to Palm because I figured, you know, he had this deal with Tandy was an investor. That's the owner of Radio Shack. So there they've got distribution bag. Casio was going to build the thing, a world-class consumer electronics manufacturer. Uh, Intuit, AOL, I mean, these sorts of names were on board. He had money from the leading VCs in the valley, uh, just, you know, big name VCs. That's and a I, sure recipe for failure, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, I, I've got it made, you know, I just have to sort of sit back and collect the money here. This is, this is going to be easy. He's lined up everything. And, um, and I got there and it was uh, pretty surprising how small the company was. Uh, I was, what, employee number, I can't remember now, nine or ten or something, something pretty small. Anybody remember? There's a few of our colleagues here. I yeah. think she was eight, but I can't swear yeah. to that. And uh, it was really a, a handful of engineers and um, a business development person and a, a marketing person. And, um, they had uh, plans to do this product, but they were really struggling with the, the Zoomer because it was based on GeoWorks, an operating system that wasn't really well tuned for this sort of device. So that operating system was evolving side by side with the applications, which made it very difficult for the developers to create the applications. There were no um, QA people. I was quite surprised by this and said, gee, you know, we <clears throat> might want to add somebody on, along those lines. Um, and, and I, don't there think, was, I don't think we had developed any software yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was really no, no infrastructure. But I, I think most of all, there was no agreements in place with um, Casio, with Tandy, with GeoWorks, with any of these companies. And so there was a lot of work to do on the side of just sort of hammering out these agreements. And they took quite a while. They were very difficult. That was one of the things I spent a lot of time on while the developers were developing the product. Uh, I was really trying to get these ag agreements done on, on the one product. This was all we were doing. We were about one thing at that time, Zoomer. That was it. And uh, in fact, it's amazing because I think we signed the Casio deal on the eve of shipping the product. I mean, it got down to literally we, we just told them, you can't ship because you don't have an agreement with us. So, you know, stop arguing about the details and, and let's sign this thing. So it was a, a very long and painful process to get there. But uh, it was, you know, there were definitely certain elements that were there and in place and, and other work that, that had yet to be done. A, a job for CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so Ed, now you started with a company in the summer of 93, just in time to see the Zoom launched and the Newton launched. He sucked me in and then I sucked him I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> well, the launch event was one of those amazing kind of wake-up calls um, with, you know, Casio and Tandy and everyone organizing this event, and obviously the Palm people there too, but it was um, quite a bit different than any launch event I'd been to before. And, and, and seeing, having been to the Newton launch event, which was this, you know, millions of dollars being spent in Apple in their incredible ways doing um, great branding and great work, um, walking into this event, I think there was a light bulb hanging over the table. There was one light there bulb. Was a, on the <laughs> the there was one light bulb. There was a big tandy like plastic banner behind it or something. And, and John Roach stood up in front of everyone and told them they're gonna buy one of these. 
Um, it, it was in it was, one slide. It said 100 hours battery life. Right, that was right. it. They're, one they're, slide. They're very focused on the battery life as a key selling point. So, um, so I kind of went, hmm, what did I get myself into here? But. Uh, Jeff and Donna were incredible salespeople, um, but also Jeff never gave me a demonstration of the handwriting recognition software, so that was. Uh, <laughs> we think Ed joined Palm because he'd been at Radius and he'd had to schlep around these massive monitors, so <laughs> he thought it looked easier to carry around these handheld devices. We were worried about it, though. We were worried he was going to, you know, like say, "Wait a second, <laughs> 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 I didn't want, you know." <laughs> so the next launch, though, was the Apple Newton launch, and a lot of money was spent on that one. And how did that go? I, was, I, mean, I, I uh, rarely seen any product. One of the reasons why I think we had some staying power in the end is we we did really realize that there was something here. There was a handheld computing business. It was gonna happen. It just depended who executed well, and. Um, and you know, one of my data points on that was the Newton, uh, which there was very few people who you'd get on any plane and they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I work for a company called Palm Computing. And they'd say, oh, is that the Newton stuff? You know, these are just random people out there. It, it generated so much excitement about it. And there was a lot of excitement in the industry and among the general public. So you knew there was a, a pent up demand for something like this. I it think just, I, I remember if one thing Ed told me once they sold 100,000 Newtons right away, right? Yeah. You know, I don't know how many came back, but they, <laughs> they sold them right away. And I think Ed said something well, 100,000 people expected to buy something. What was it? You know, <laughs> and let's go find out. And so. Ed put in a program to go out and actually talk to the Newton owners, because there was a lot more Newton owners than there were Zoomer owners, and, and say, well, you don't like We're not going to give you that number. Yeah. <laughs> you, say, you say, you don't like the Zoomer, you really hate the Zoomer, but what did you think it was going to do? And then we kind of tried to make that. That was some of the early data, I think, that really um, you know, coalesced around the ideas of the pilot. So the company didn't look into a very good shape here. The one product that has the Zuma bombs. And we had another product, which was the, uh, which was the Sharp PT9000, mm -hmm. which Sharp had done because they heard Casio was doing the Zuma. Mm -hmm. And did you bring that one? Oh, I didn't bring the PT9000. The one. The so one. Built? The one we have. I have one in a box. And and that was really bad. We knew it too. So. Um, <laughs> I don't think ever shipped. How did I get onto that? What was well, that? we had other products oh, we had as other well. Products. We had some software well. products. We yes. were selling graffiti, shrink wrap version of graffiti mm -hmm. for um, the Newton, the Zoomer, and the Magic Cap devices. Three environments, multi-platform. We were <laughs> selling uh, Palm Connect for the um, HP products, as well as for the Zoomer that helped you connect the product to the PC. So we had some some revenue sources. I, weren't you the one who it, rang the bell whenever we got an order? <laughs> it I is important to remember that <laughs> this company was very focused on being a software company, so we, yes. were, we were not doing hardware. This, the hardware side of it was kind yeah. of handled by these other players. And in so fact, we had right. to figure out how to do other software in fact, products our around. Our big it. product opportunity was Palm Connect. The idea is you'd buy a Zoomer, and then in order to connect it to your PC, you'd have to buy this software package with a cable from us called Palm Connect. And we said, look, everyone who uses this product has to buy one of these things. So Because like it crashes a, once every few well, hours. But, <laughs> no, but, but it was an essential part. And it was, we figured everyone's going to buy it. It's a very high attach rate. It's $100. So, boy, what a great market opportunity. And I remember it was Walt Mossberg, I believe, of the Wall Street Journal, who called us to task on that. He wrote about the Zoom and he says, well, what a ridiculous thing. There's this thing you need to connect to the PC and the connectivity kit. And they're charging you an extra hundred dollars. It ought to be included in the product. And I said, "Oh my goodness, he's right." And, and well, we didn't want to tell anybody else, you see, because we made eight dollars of royalty on the Zoomer and a hundred dollars on Palm Connect. <laughs> but this was the whole business plan, and we quickly learned that it, Walt was correct that our entire business plan was based on a false assumption that we should be selling something which really should be included in the product. And that was one of the reasons why we focus on connectivity in the Palm Pilot. We said it has to be a connectivity solution. It has to be built around connectivity. We better we, we can't sell connectivity as a solution. We, and that's one of the reasons we ended up doing everything. It also drove us to try and think of other products that would have very high attach rates. Because one of the problems was, you know, fundamental business lesson here, it's really hard to make a business adding on to products that don't sell. Um, <laughs> 
So you can do all the spreadsheets in the world, and I guarantee you'll never come up with a good business plan on that one. Um, so we, we try to figure out, I remember Andrea actually was the CEO of a little company called Stylus International. Um, we were too embarrassed to uh, admit that we were trying to sell pens. Um, because we knew pens would be lost and stuff, so we said, oh, let's sell pens. We can add on those to all these products. And so um, we started a little thing called Stylus International, too, to try and make some extra money. So we sold styluses under a pseudonym. <laughs> so people wouldn't know that that was really Palm Computer. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> we wouldn't want to dent that golden image we have. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You took ads out and everything, I think, right? So despite the thriving stylus sales from Stylus International um, and the graffiti sales, Point Connect sales, all the software in the world, um, we were not a thriving uh, business. And at some point, I think you three had to look at each other and admit this wasn't going anywhere. We needed a new plan. <laughs> I think that to me that turning point was that we had embarked on Zoomer 2. We had learned um, a lot from Zoomer 1. We knew what we'd done wrong, or at least some of what we'd done wrong, and we knew what we could do better. And we embarked on a mission to do the next generation. We were from, you know, the PC business, right? You, you always do the next rev. You have to have the next rev sort of in your sights as you're finishing the last one. So it was very natural to us. And we just assumed that all of our partners would agree with us. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the real turning point for us was when, you know, Casio basically told us, we're not doing Zoomer 2, basically until we sell all the Zoomer 1s we still have around, which was not looking very good. <laughs> so they uh, essentially had no plan to start on Zoomer 2. Now, we'd actually already invested quite a bit of time and effort in, in redesigning these apps and making them faster and making them smaller and in really figuring out how to improve this product. And I think when they said no Zoomer 2 was when we really had to look at each other and say, geez, what's the plan here? Um, that was our, our big hope. Did any of you ever give up hope for the company? I don't know. Did you ever give up hope? No, I thought I was the main cheerleader. I don't know. Is that I think we had about, I don't know, a few million dollars left in the bank or something. And I, I remember that was right at the time where the Internet was just starting to kind of take off. And there were all these companies starting up. All the VCs were funding all these companies. We said, geez, we could, you know, do a browser or something. <laughs> <laughs> we explored all sorts of things like whether to get into this connectivity business in a big way. Maybe we could do Palm Connect for every kind of device out there. I think that was another turning point. It's described in Andrea's book where uh, one of our big opportunities was Scion, who was one of the leaders in handheld computing at the time. And we made a pitch to them to do their connectivity solution. Again, with a high attach rate, that might have been a reasonable business. But uh, they ended up saying no. So we, we were always sort of going down paths and, and looking at opportunities that seemed like sort of rational extensions to what we, we had learned and what we had done. I remember very distinctly uh, worrying about a lot of people's morale because a lot of people were very kind of doom and gloom about it. Uh, I remember also feeling very um, certain that the, in, the market would be there, that, that I never gave up hope on the market. I never gave hope that the handheld computing market would occur if you had the right product. And so what we had to do is figure out what to do until we figured out how to get the right product. So that's when we kind of making up, you know, the connectivity business and the graffiti business. And we were struggling for all these things, you know, for a while. There was a period of four months or so there. I think we were just like everything we looked at, we said, well, can we do this for a while? Can we do this for a while? Can we do this for a while? Until the market takes off. We never gave up on the market, but it was, you know, questionable whether we would make it to the end. Then Donna, you and Jeff went to a meeting with Bruce Dunleavy, which seems to have become a big turning point. Yeah, we went to, to this meeting with Bruce, and, and we pretty much were complaining. And uh, what we were complaining about was our partners. So we had done deals with Cassio. Cassio won't do this or that. Sharp won't listen to us. HP won't, won't do this. Um, Scion has said no. Um, and the list just sort of goes on and on. We were working with every major player in the realm of handheld computing. We knew them all. And we couldn't get any of them to do the product that we thought was the right product. And, and Bruce sort of listened to us for a while. And then he said, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little sick of hearing you guys complain about the, all this stuff and your partners. You know, if you know what to do, then why don't you just go do it? And it was one of those sort of very simple statement wake-up calls, if you will. You know, we'd always thought of ourselves as a software company. We're application software. That's what we're doing. And his challenge was really to say, 
look beyond that, um, if you looked at the whole process, the hardware, the software, everything, what would that be? And I think that sort of set Jeff in motion to think about, well, what would that be? Yeah, in fact, when we started Palm, the interesting thing was, it was very unfashionable to do hardware. When we started Palm, this is the height of software is in. So the, the venture firms basically said, you know, we'll fund you as a software company, but nothing else. And basically, in, in this, and now we're into it by how many years now? Two years or two and a half years or something like that. And the, the, it, the, the, our board member, Bruce, basically said, threw it back and says, well, you know, you know, you know, what would you do? And we said, well, we have to do the whole thing. And he said, okay, why don't you go do that? It was still very unfashionable to do hardware, yes. however, as we learned as we tried to raise money over the uh, next couple of years. It was uh, definitely an extremely audacious thing to say, here we have 28 people, um, no hardware engineers, really Jeff, but no uh, other hardware engineers. I almost said real hardware engineers, yeah. but I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, 28 people, um, no manufacturing people or anything. And, and, and it was just, it was a crazy idea. In fact, Bruce was the only person on our board who thought it was a good idea. I'd say the other board members thought it was a pretty lousy idea. Pretty crazy idea. They said, what about Go and EO? Those guys were all meant to everybody. They're all losing, you know, they all went out of business. You're crazy. Our employees thought the same thing. Yeah, I think <laughs> they still might. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> We, you know, I, I look back and say, why were we willing to be so crazy and take on such a, a big job there? And I think part of it was all three of us had been from hardware companies. So Jeff had been from Grid, I'd been from Apple, Ed had been from Radius. So I think that for all of us, it was less intimidating than maybe it was for the people who'd sort of come out of a software-only career. And for us, it was, well, okay, so if we have to do hardware to create the whole solution, then, then we'll go do hardware because that's what it takes to do the solution. So it just seemed less intimidating, and, and we figured we could outsource um, what we needed and, and partner on what we needed, which is, which is what we did. I have a funny story from the outsourcing because we needed, it, we needed an industrial design firm to do the mechanical engineering and industrial design. And I had worked for some of the leading firms uh, previously, uh, some of them who ro later rolled into IDL. And later we worked with IDL, but we were really small at this time. We couldn't afford IDL at that time. And sorry, Dennis, who's in the audience. But so what we needed a design firm. I, I said, I don't know who else to go to. And Ed said, let's get the yellow pages. And so he takes out the yellow pages. And sure enough, he goes, call these guys. And we, and which is what we did. And we ended up calling Palo Alto Design. <laughs> it was like, that's how it, you know. You called five or six well, firms. But that, but, was, you know, that was the first one. I, I remember you just saying, you said, damn, let's look at the It was, that, and you were the first one. You were the first one you called. And ended up being the, the best. Yeah, it was pretty funny. But at this time, remember, I mean, the sort of career, the career progression of a lot of people in Silicon Valley and the, the funding progression of all the VCs in Silicon Valley had been roughly the following. It started semiconductors. And then everybody left semiconductors and started sort of PCs and hardware. And then everybody, when that got commoditized, everybody left PCs and hardware and started software. And then when that got commoditized, everybody left software and started networking. And then when that sort of was getting commoditized, everybody was now going into the internet. So we were down at this stage saying to people, we got a great idea. Let's go back here and do hardware. And um, this was not really a very well received idea. <laughs> So for about two years, it seemed like Donna's favorite thing in the world was fundraising and asking for money from VCs and companies because she needed some. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'd say from day one, joining Palm, pretty much um, what I did was raise money from, from there and probably until today. I still consider that one of my number one jobs. So, um, And you'll read in Andrea's book, I, I'm known to say cash is queen, but um, I really... Uh, <laughs> really felt uh, it was critical. I mean, it's, it's just simple math, you know, starting cash, what's cash coming in, what's cash going out, ending cash, you don't want that formula to end up at zero, then you're in trouble. So, um, you know, we spent a lot of time worrying about um, cutting, you know, expenditures and keeping them low, and, and we were um, incredibly efficient, low cost. I, I didn't realize how cheap I was, in fact, until I read the book, where it <laughs> mentions it over and over again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that, that being very prudent in spending. You weren't the only one. Okay. I remember the day Ed, came, Ed wanted to buy $300 worth of buttons. And we, we argued about the P.O. for the 300 dollars <laughs> worth of buttons. Well, I know. It's when, I, when I first started Palm, my first executive decision was to buy an overhead projector, which you argued with me about because you thought that was an extravagance that we really couldn't afford as a startup. Was it an overhead projector or was it a slide projector? 
I think it was the slide. The old man was cheap, and you wanted to buy the slide for Jeff. All right, Andrea, keep it going. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff and Donna at work. This is what it's like to work with us, too, this, believe it or not. This really is it. So, um, Ed, you spent days and days in the design meetings of the pilot. Um, describe those. Um, wow. Uh, really, I think, uh, amazing experience for me and also uh, for the team because um, we, we literally talked about, you know, practically every pixel on the screens and, and every button and, and how many taps and every, you know, we, we worked through these things in great detail. I certainly was not a, a, you know, a huge contributor there. There are many people in this room who did a lot more than I did, including you know, obviously Jeff, but a lot of other folks here. Um, but it was an amazing experience because we really did focus on every bit of, of the user um, experience and how they were going to interact with this product. And I think it came out in the end um, making this very simple. The whole idea, for instance, of, of turning on the device when you, and seeing your day with one tap seems so simple now, but at the time, no one did it. Um, the only thing we had a, one example, which is you, you'd get a page. When you had a pager, you get a page and you pull it off your your belt and you push the button and there was the page. And and that seemed really simple. But every other handheld computer that had been made had an on-off switch that you had to use. And it, 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 there's things like that that obviously we took some ideas from other things, but also um, really worked very hard. And, and in particular, uh, a gentleman named Rob Haitani. Um, who has now become one of the premier you know, interface designers, I think, in, in the industry. And uh, this was one thing that he really worked very hard on. I think one of Rob's examples that I, I always liked was he'd say, imagine if when you look at your watch and you want to get the time, if you had to launch watch OS, boot <laughs> watch apps, get time, how you'd go crazy. And that was sort of the analogy to why looking up your calendar, are you putting up with this incredible number of steps to get to what's Everyone your else, you'd turn on the device and their logo would show up. Like that's valuable for you. <laughs> how, much, um, was, um, how much of the idea had Jeff fleshed out already when he came to these design meetings? Uh, a great deal of the, the fundamental conceptual idea about what the kind of core applications, the form factor of the device, what, what, what the, uh, you know, the fundamental kind of design and inner workings of it would be, how it would connect to a PC, things like that, but not the details on the applications at all. And, and those were just started from scratch. Geez, we need a date book. Okay, well, Rob, go off and, and hypercard. He used to design up all these things. and. And we'd, we'd work through them and sit down in those meetings and go over every one of those button pushes and how someone would interact and how you'd touch the screen and where it would go and what would happen when it touched and what was the next dialogue and incredible levels of design. And then we took a lot of those hypercard designs actually to focus groups and we let people play with them and walk, and walk through it and actually use it. And then we'd uh, do more and more improvement and eventually you know, the engineers would, would do a great job of implementing that in the software. But it was a very collaborative design process too where the engineers were very involved and the marketing people were involved and Jeff was involved and I was involved from time to time where we'd really just go back and forth and, and people have very strong opinions about particular functionality but um, in the end we'd come to an agreement and we'd execute and, and we kept going and it, 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 was, it was really a thrilling kind of experience and, and it kept moving along and s suddenly the product was working and um, you know, some great design work. Rob Python used to have a saying in the early times of Palm, products that don't suck, that was the motto for the software products. <laughs> and that motto became rapidly much better in that it became delights the customer <laughs> for the pilot. <laughs> You know, one of the, just to know, one of the real key differences, I think, is having come off the Zoomer project where all those things that Ed just went through were all negotiated with six parties. And now these guys could go into these meetings, have a debate, but then make a decision and move on. And that difference created, I think, just a, a, a much better design process, process and a much more satisfying product in the end, rather than what was really compromised products and products designed by committee. So, Jeff, were all the technologies you needed in place? Did we have to invent anything? Uh, no, in fact, we, we specifically, um, and I think this has been true for all the time we were at Palm and even at Handspring, we, we don't like to view ourselves as a technology company. So, uh, we never want a technology be the risk in a product. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, we would try to design things with, with technology that wasn't leading edge. For example, on the microprocessor side, uh, they were faster microprocessors we could use, 
but they were more expensive and more difficult to get or whatever. And I basically said in edict, no, the performance of the processor is going to be equivalent to a 5 megahertz 8088. And, and we have to make the product the instantaneous performance with that microprocessor as opposed to trying to go to a more modern microprocessor which would be more expensive and more power consumptive. We took that approach through all of this. We tried to tried to take the least sort of technology risky approach. Still, there were some things that were we ended up being on the leading edge of. Uh, we ended up uh, being on the leading edge, <laughs> and it turned out, on the microprocessor. We, um, we, we ended up switching to the Motorola microprocessor, which, was, um, which is not high performance, but it was a more integrated product, and that, we had a lot of problems with that. But pretty much, pretty much we, we avoided sort of a, a technology statement. Or a tech, I tried to avoid pushing the technology envelope. So it was a matter of packaging it up, and the key, we felt, was not in technology. The key was in user interface interaction. The whole, and it was the entire experience of the, of the customer, from when they purchase it to when they open the box, when they turn it on, to when they plug it in. All, you know, the, we, we tried to consider the entire experience because that was what defined the success of the product. It wasn't just what was on the screen. Uh, and I think a lot of the innovations we came up with because we sort of had that bent to it. But really focus on user experience, not on technology. In my opinion, the, the fundamental design breakthrough of the product had, was not technology. It was actually a positioning um, thing, which is that it was the idea that it was an accessory to a PC. That, that idea drove so many more, so many of the design elements around the product. How, fun, how functional the date book was, or the address book was, um, how much memory the device had to have, uh, how big it could be. Um, a lot of those things were driven by the fact that we knew you'd go back and connect this all the time and, and synchronize it with the PC. And, and so that, that was, I think, the really big breakthrough that drove so many other things, including a lot of the marketing effort around it, because ultimately then you could target your audience more specifically and other things like that. So, Tell us a bit about the Palm OS, about coming up with it. Well, one thing we were very scared of is we didn't want to do an operating system because the companies who had done operating systems had all failed. They had already been the, you know, the Go Penpoint OS conference, and there was the Newton Data Soup Kitchens, whatever things they had. And, um, and, there was, you know, and, and people were coming out with declaring operating systems and declaring platforms, and they were all like you know, dying and collapsing. And so we said, well, we can't do that. And so we kind of uh, issued the whole concept of doing an OS. We're doing a product. We're doing a product, and the product is an organizer. It's not, you know, a PDA with, you know, intelligence and intelligent agents and all this other stuff. It was just an organizer, and, and the OS sort of became subservient to it. So the OS was subservient to synchronization, and the OS was subservient to the, all the other things. In fact, we defeatured the operating system so much initially, and it's not true anymore, but initially we defeatured it so much that the engineers, uh, I, I remember a conversation with Monty Boyers in the audience tonight, the engineers basically said, we refuse to call this an operating system, it's so, it's so primitive. I said, fine, don't call it an operating system. You know? <laughs> um, but I knew it was an operating system, and I knew it would, it would evolve over time. But it was, it was, that was the thinking again was, focus on customer experience, don't focus on technology, and the technology is subservient to the customer experience. In fact, we didn't announce an OS until, Donna said we weren't going to have an OS until we had a million customers. She said we're not going to have a conference until we've sold a million devices because we were just so sick of these companies declaring themselves the standard in OSs with no customers. And we just thought that was foolish. So we felt that, you know, you earned being a standard by having customers. So, in fact, we announced our millionth um, pilot at our first developer conference, so it was uh, the timing was totally coincident with that. There's uh, there is a more sad part of the story, which is Pawn running out of money and Donna trying to get money out of anyone she can talk to <laughs> for once in her life. With a hat. <laughs> And Don is persistent and incredibly uh, effective, but she wasn't in that one time. What happened? Well, you know, again, the timing was uh, not very good. We've added up. There was probably a billion dollars lost between all those other companies we've mentioned um, this evening, including our own failures with the, with the Zoomer and other things. So there had been about a billion dollars lost. And we're walking around to the VC community saying, you know, well, we want to try it one more time. And, and look, we got it right this time, okay? 
And, and it was just met with skepticism. I mean, it was very clear very quickly uh, that the VC community was not going to support this. Um, it was a failed category. They had moved on. The Internet was starting. It was hot. It was wild. Netscape had just gone public. I mean, all of the sort of investment community focus was in that direction, and, and we were really, truly passe. So uh, that wasn't working. We had a little more uh, luck and reception with potential corporate investors. So. We spent an awful lot of time running down potential corporate investors and uh, in the end just kept sort of getting mired down time after time in um, discussions where, you know, we were very concerned about losing control over this product. We knew one of the reasons we were developing it fast and efficiently and well was because we were retaining control. And so every time we got into these corporate discussions where they had uh, motivations to meddle and, and create you know, participate in the creation of the product, it was very threatening to us because we felt that we wouldn't do as good of a product. So that always sort of uh, slowed us down there. And in the end, it, it just proved to be a, a very, very difficult climate for us to raise capital for this product. Um, just very difficult. We didn't run out of money mm -hmm. completely. No, we um, never, we actually were never in danger of running out of money because we always started raising money as soon as we put the last one in the bank. <laughs> so we were always raising money, but we, we actually never ran out of money. And the day we closed the U.S. robotics deal, I think I had to wire them our uh, million and a half dollars that was left in the bank. So uh, we actually did still have cash in the bank, but it was not enough to launch the pilot. It was, it was short of what we needed to launch the pilot. And eventually you had to sell the company. Well, I, you know. Had to sell is a strong word. That's um, right. You know, we were kind of, you know, starting to believe these other people, too, you know. It's like, you loser, you loser, you loser. Oh, I guess I'm a loser, you know, why are we saying this? Um, after, you know, seriously, it kind of wears down on you after a while. And so we still believed in the product, but we weren't 100% certain, you know. Gosh, maybe we were fooling ourselves. and. It, we couldn't be positive that it was going to be a big success. No one thought it was going to be successful. So, uh, you know, it was really a matter of, gee, okay, we've got to the point where the product is pretty much done in development, but if we want to bring it to market, we need more money now. And do we want to spend, stop it and try to spend time finding more money, or do we want to go and get some more money in an easier way to get the product to market? And at this point in time, uh, none of us had any ideals of making any money off of this anything anymore. We were in it because of the product. We were in it because we said, oh, you know, we, our heart and soul was in this thing. We wanted to be successful. We wanted to bring it out there. And so, gosh, well, if we sell the company uh, to the appropriate uh, suitor, then, then we would have the opportunity to make the product successful. Well, we weren't really not looking to sell the company. We weren't shopping the company at all. We were continuing to look to raise money. But what happened was one of the companies we approached as a potential investor, U.S. Robotics, got very interested in buying the company. And that was really what initiated the conversation. Yes. In fact, we'd had opportunities to sell the company before that we, we hadn't even considered. Um, Motorola had been probably the most um, aggressive in those lines of, of proposing that they acquire us. But they wanted to acquire us to use the technology we're developing in their products, not to bring this product to market. So uh, what appealed to us when we met U.S. Robotics was they fell in love with the product too and they looked at the product and they said this is great. They were a, a business that was based on modems. They felt modems were going to be at the end of their life. Uh, they were becoming chips on the motherboard. Independent modems were going away. So they were looking for what is the next um, generation of products that they can have as a future for their company and they looked at this product and said this could really be big, this could really be something. And um, that was you know, very refreshing for us and I think that uh, for me, the, the real turning point in that discussion was when you know, they basically said, look, we're going to put the money behind this that this needs to, to succeed. And all of a sudden, it became clear that that was, an, that was access to capital. And that is why on the pilots that you see here on the screen, there's a US Robotics logo and not a palm computing logo. Mm -hmm. um, we've just come to the end of the, the moderator talk, and we want to open it to questions. I have a question with regard to um, Xerox winning the patent award. Is there, how does that change the landscape, or is it just a minor uh, blip on the road? Well, Xerox has not won a patent award yet. Xerox is in litigation with Palm, not with Handspring, so we really can't comment on the litigation. But they've been in litigation for about five years over uh, this particular issue. So. 
Um, I, let me just say, it's, it's not over. It's actually in the appeals process. So um, I don't think we know yet how that's going to come out. It's gone both it, ways. Just for everyone's benefit, it's about graffiti and how, how graffiti was designed and developed. Yes. Uh, can you talk about uh, what occurred at 3Com when Palm was spun off from 3Com and then also the transition period uh, to Handspring from there? Well, we were not at 3Com when 3Com spun off Palm. So you might ask some of the others in the room <laughs> who were there. Uh, you know, we left 3Com after a, a year under 3Com's management of, of trying very hard to convince them that the right thing to do was to spin off Palm. We felt it needed a separate business focus. We felt it was a different business model. We felt we needed different compensation systems. We felt that uh, just about everything about it was different than 3Com's core networking business. And uh, we worked very hard. I worked very hard for, for a year and was unfortunately as successful at that as I had been at raising money before. So I'm not sure what that says about me. But uh, in, in the end, uh, 3Com decided not to spin it off. That's when we left and we created Handspring and uh, decided that we, we couldn't be successful staying at 3Com. We really needed to create a separate company to uh, be able to focus on this opportunity. And uh, subsequently to that, in fact, I think it was probably a year after that, uh, 3Com then decided to spin off Palm. So that was actually after we left. I think it's important to say, I, don't, I can speak for myself, and may, I don't know about Ed and Donna, but uh, I did not want to start another company. I did not want to leave Palm. Um, but we felt if we were going to stick it out in the competition of Microsoft and all this fierce competition, that we weren't going to do it as a division of an ailing networking company. And, and so it was, it was not, a, in a sense, a, a great or a joyous or exciting thing. It was like, oh, God, we've got to do this again uh, type of thing, because it wasn't our first choice to leave uh, and to start a business, hands -bang. But we're very happy yeah, to do it. Absolutely. I mean, you, you feel like you, you've kind of climbed this huge mountain. I mean, we've just gone from selling you know, styluses to um, <laughs> being you know, one of the standards in the industry, and it's really starting to grow and explode, and all of a sudden you go, OK, reset. Yeah. Um, so it was not something everyone was dying to do, but it was it's what we really felt we needed to do if we wanted to create a really independent company that was a leading brand in handheld computing, and that's what we want to do. And we're still we're still working hard at that. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I, I think for uh, maybe the entire team, there there seems to be a set of design decisions that um, all kind of came together, and I'm kind of curious about in hindsight which ones if you could pick one or two which were most important. That is, when I look at size, I look at the choice of apps, the ease of use, the price point, and the one that came out of the book which I clearly didn't understand until I heard it again tonight, which was thinking of this as an attached accessory to a computer rather than all the alternatives which thought of themselves as standalones. When you take a look at all those, and I probably missed a couple others, I mean you emphasize the ease of use of tapping, and you know, a number, minimum number of taps, which one or two or three, or was it the, the holistic all of them? I think, I, I think the answer to that question is, is, is in a sort of a, a meta level above that. And, uh, and the meta level above that might be, for example, we, we realized we were competing with paper and not computers, for example. That's one, one example. We felt the paper daytimer, we, we came to realize was our competition. We were trying to get people to stop using paper and use a computer. And, and then when you, when you, that's an example of a meta sort of decision and, with, and a lot of things flow from that. Where you then say, oh, well I have to be better than paper. I'm not trying to be better than this computer thing. I'm not trying to be what the computer thing is doing. And so, you know, we actually would count how many seconds and steps it would take to, to do things on paper and try to be better than that. Uh, and, and then the other one is the one Ed mentioned, which is, you know, the whole PC connectivity thing, which is, I, I gave you the origin of that. That was the Walt Mossberg thing where he said, you idiots. That's not an accessory. That's part of the product. You know, I was like, oh. The other thing is that was one of our products. We were selling this connectivity, and it, you know, was it wasn't dawned on us one day. We were looking at the sales rate that we were selling. You know, ninety percent of the people who'd bought a Zoomer bought a connectivity kit. Hmm. Ding dong. But those things you mentioned, really, those were Jeff's first slide. I mean, when he when he had the slide of, here is what we are going to do. It had sort of four bullet points on it. Said. Two ninety nine, fits in a man's shirt pocket, designed around connectivity, extremely easy to use. 
I mean, that, that was it. And so it was sort of those things very explicitly day one. And often we'd go along and decisions that had to be made would be tested against that list. Well, does it serve that list or does it defeat that list? And that would help you decide whether it went in or not. Those are hard decisions, too. Uh, they were very highly debated, you know, do we include infrared or not, do we include backlight or not, do we include how much memory, how much horse CPU power, all these things that are very hotly debated, uh, but we did use the list. We went back to time and time again. Um, it was also, I think there was some fun things in doing there too. There's like, there's things that just bother the heck out of me on PCs, you know, I just can't stand them. And I mean, we would try to we would try to incorporate some of that thinking too. I remember, it wasn't in the book. I don't know. Someone reminded us recently, but I hate error messages that come on the screen, and they tell you you got this error, but and they say, you know, do you want to continue or not? But you have no idea what the error means. And you have no idea what to do about it. <laughs> so I said, if there's an error message that is unintelligible to the user, then don't show it to them. Reset the machine. Do anything else. I don't care anything else other than tell the user, you idiot, here's something, and I don't know what there's to do. There's an error and, and an okay button. Yeah, it's like <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I'm bored. Like, you know, I said, would the customer be happier? Would the customer be happier seeing the thing reset and see the splash screen again? I said, they'd probably be happier seeing that than an error message. You know, if we can't figure it out and they can't figure it out, what difference does it make? You know, so. We did a lot of things like that. It became sort of our personal peeving sessions about PCs. No hourglasses. No hourglasses. Yeah. No, 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 Rob used to no say, we cursor. didn't design a weight cursor in the system. We didn't design a weight cursor. It's like, you know, no weight cursors, instant on. Instant I mean, on. Boy, yeah. how long do we wait to boot our PC? Yeah, I'll take, can I even go on a little more? Just, sure. Right. No <laughs> I, I love telling this story because, because um, it's very telling about sort of computer design versus human interface interaction design. We have the calendar button on, on our products and the Palm products, and the calendar button specifically takes you to today. It's today. It's your appointments. It's what you're doing next. In fact, we even scroll the day up if we have to so you can see your next appointments depending on the time of the day. So when you push that button, you see what you're doing next. And our competitors copied this, but they didn't get it. They, for years and years and years, they may still not get it. I don't know. But, you know, on a, on a Microsoft product, for example, you push that button, it takes you to the calendar. It may not be today. It may be on another day, whatever day you were last looking at. And so you go there and you don't know if you're looking at the today or not. And it's these kind of things which we just, we just had these great sessions. We just sat around and Ed and I and Rob and Art and a few other people. Uh, and we just would just like think through these things in great, great level of detail. It was fun. It was really fun to do those things. So in my mind, there's two really brilliant things about the Palm that haven't been mentioned. One is the single focus that is just going to be, you know, your organizer. Not just the connectivity, but you're not going to have a kitchen sink. You're going to really focus on real specific purpose. The other is the idea of graffiti. That up until then, things like the Newton, you had handwriting analysis, which was always very error prone. And here was a case where you said, darn it, we're not going to do that. We're going to train the user in how to write our way so that we get higher recognition. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit about how that came about and why you thought of that brilliant idea. Is that me? Yeah, sure. it'd be you. <laughs> um, all right, so back to we're doing the Zoomer, right? And one of the things we needed for the Zoomer, because it was a stylus based machine, everyone was saying, what's the handwriting recognition going to be like? And I had this handwriting recognition we had, uh, I developed when I was a grid called palm print. And I knew it wasn't very good. In fact, I knew all handwriting recognition wasn't very good. And I was, you know, I was like, my whole design focus on the Zoomer was, let's not focus on the handwriting recognition because it stinks. And, and so we did all this work on ink, shrinking ink, ink. And shrinking ink and intelligent ink and all this stuff. And backspace we ink. Backspace ink. We were, we were in, but the other we filed part, a patent on that one. The, the <laughs> other partners didn't want to hear a word of this because they felt the future was handwriting recognition. And I kept saying, mm, not really. And they felt that I was like begging, you know, I was like avoiding doing my job. And I was like, and so we had a lot of debates about this. And, and palm print was pretty bad and all the handwriting recognition was pretty bad. So I guess coming into this, we always knew it was bad. And, and we tried to focus on it. Now, when we came around to, um, to starting to work uh, after the Zoomer, I guess, I, I said, we've got to solve this problem. There, there, is, there were several problems that we had, really bad problems, and text input was one of them. And I said, we just got to solve it. And it's, I, we've got to come up with something that works on very small devices. Uh, and you knew that you couldn't do traditional handwriting recognition because in German, the words go on forever. And I'm serious, I'm not joking about that. So, you know, you couldn't, 
You couldn't divide a little device and write it out in your kashnucha, you know? <laughs> so. Can you give us a better example, please, Andre? <laughs> That just wasn't going to cut it. So I was very open and receptive to, uh, to you know, other things. And, and, you know, one of the things that we'd always known about both palm print, that it worked better if you wrote like I wrote, right? Because I, you know, originally created it. And so people said, Jeff, it really works well for you because you use your handwriting. And that was one of the sort of the germs of, of the creation of, of graffiti was like, okay, so what if we people, teach people to write like me? And, 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 and I'll tell you one more thing. And then people said, this is crazy. You're going to tell people how to write. No one's going to learn how to do anything. And I said, look, they learn how to type on a keyboard. What is the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life? You've got 26 letters. You've got 101 keys. People are proud of that. It's like 101 keys. Ay, ay, ay. And, so, and it takes months to learn how to type. And, and, and people like that. I, it's crazy. So I said, what if it took 15 minutes? I mean, how bad could that be? So... You know, that was the premise. I said, look, people will learn it. And I, I said, people will learn a tool if it works. As long as the tool works. If the tool one day does one thing, one day does the other thing, they, they don't stand it. It's, but if the tool works, they like it. So that was sort of the... I was one of those skeptics, and, and the one that threw me over the top is Jeff reminded me that people had learned to use DOS, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and they and I said, it. wow, you're right. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> My favorite was when, when Jeff was uh, developing the graffiti alphabet, because you know, to really sort of think about what each of these characters was going to be, he would, he would do it to you know, himself in front of every meeting. He would just simulate it and write it in ink before we had it on a computer. And so he would just write over and over and over again and get until there was just a solid block of ink under there. He was taking notes. And if there were people in the meeting who didn't know him, and they'd, they'd sort of look over it. What's he doing? And I'd say, shh, he's inventing. <laughs> Tim that graffiti was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Do you have any favorite anecdotes from the user community? One that I've heard, don't know if it's apocryphal, is that a businessman, a businessman got in front of a group on a whiteboard, started writing in graffiti, and nobody objected. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my kids, I, I do have a story about my, my uh, elder daughter, uh, Kay. With, at the time, she was very young. I forget how old she was. She was like, I'm looking at my wife for a clue here. Um, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe she was five years old or something like that. And I was developing graffiti, but it hadn't been shown to anyone as a secret. And she was asking me what I was doing, and I explained it to her. I said, oh, it's a new way of writing. I'm working on it. It looks like this. So the next day, she comes home from school with a little art, you know, eight by heaven left art project on it. And she'd signed her name, Kate, in graffiti. <laughs> and, 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 and that has the K, which is a weird letter, and it has the A without the cross, and the T is a little bit of a weird letter. So, you know, I was like, well, so I can imagine her teacher saying, what is it you're doing, Kate? And she said, oh, I'm writing graffiti. My dad taught me how to do it, you know? <laughs> so, so I told her, I said, Kate, you can't do that. And she said, why not? You do it. And I was like, well, trust me, you can't do that. So I think she was the first, um, I don't know, first user of graffiti, but, <laughs> but, but she picked it up immediately, which is the thing, you know, we, Ed did a lot of testing on this, and um, Ed's really good at testing these things, and we found out that the younger you are, the easier it is to learn, uh, maybe not too surprising, but the kids just pick it up instantly. But what, I mean, we did do user groups on it, because we were, we were going, is anybody going to learn this? Is this just, is this just crazy? And we actually mocked up some devices that had little keyboards on them, and then we had we had the you know wizards and things like that. And then we walked in and we said, "Here you go. You can have this device with this little keyboard, and this is a familiar way of entering data. Or you can write this little crazy alphabet here, and I'm going to write it out on the board." And we wrote it out. And we said, "And you write it in this space, and you do it just like this." And we thought everyone would just go, "What are you crazy?" And they all said, hey, "I'd rather have that little alphabet." <laughs> We, we just sat behind the glass going, are you, I'm just, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. So now our Palm Pilots are becoming cell phones and they're starting to talk to other devices. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you all see for the future? Yeah. Oh, anyone of us. Well, I can tell you what. I can tell our current product. This is the future of communications. <laughs> w, w, w. <laughs> www.handspring.com. I love Ed. Ed, 
I can never sell my own product. I'm embarrassed when people use my product. But Ed is not, and he's um, always there. I get, to tell, I get to tell my kid's story now, which is my, my eight-year-old William, who I've now taught to say, I, I pull this out of my pocket and say, William, what is this? And he says, Daddy, that's the future of communications. <laughs> Right. And he, he says that to everybody, so we got that. I, but, you know, in a, in a serious vein, all right, so here's a real serious thing. Um, we, you know, Donna described when she first saw that Sony Palm Top, she said, this is the future of personal computing, and I think Ed probably felt the same way. That, that's why he probably joined Palm. Um, we really do feel that, you know, devices, the kind of devices we're working on in a small, reliable, inexpensive uh, uh, easy to use devices are the future of personal computing. If you want to get, you know, six billion or four billion or three billion or any number of billion people on the planet to get the benefits of personal computing, it can't be that thing that sits on your desk or under your desk or in your in a laptop. Those products are too expensive. They take too much resources. Take too much power. Take too many IT professionals to keep them running. It's just impossible. So we we do say, look, the future. If you want to bring the power of the stuff to the world, you have to make less smaller and inexpensive products. The Trio, which is a very nice product, I admit, I, one of my favorites, um, <laughs> is, uh, this is really quite a good product. Um, you know, it's, you know, now all of a sudden you got a phone, and you got your email, and you got messaging, and you got browsing and stuff, and it's really gonna happen. Every device, and every little pocket device in the future is gonna have a fast, inexpensive internet connection, and you're gonna use it for voice and data and transactions and so on. And, and we think it's a, there's a good social benefit to that, or, and we take that as a sort of serious submission. Submission, not submission. <laughs> Does Linux have any future as a replacement for your OS? No. <laughs> How about that? How about this? Here's a different spin on it. Does uh, do open source operating systems perhaps have a future? Perhaps uh, th that's a good thing about Linux. Linux itself is not a very good operating system for a handheld device. It's just ar architected correctly. It doesn't have the right fundamental structures in terms of memory management, in terms of uh, data management, in terms of security and other things. It wasn't designed for that. It was designed for servers. Uh, and then what people like about it is a great operating system, but it's 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 people like the fact they, they the people are thinking about putting it on handhelds because it's open and they like that too. So let's separate the technology from Linux from the open source of Linux, and those are two separate issues. I think the open source thing could really play out, but the technology probably not. Hi, uh, two questions, please. Um, the trio has a keyboard. How did that come back after what you talked about? And, we noticed. Uh, oh. <laughs> and the other one, in the book, uh, it seems the pilot launch was uh, very software bug free. You had hardware problems with the little spring, et cetera. Can you give us some secrets of your uh, software development and testing? Well, uh, Trio has a keyboard. Wow. Um, yes, there are two versions of Trio, actually. One is for all those people who we convinced to learn graffiti. <laughs> and we decided to provide them with a version of it that had a graffiti on it. But um, the reason it has a keyboard is we really feel that it is the better way of using a communications focused device. And for a couple of reasons. One is messaging is more of a part of this than it is of an organizer. Okay, And so some of the fundamental applications here were, were driven by data entry, and less so in an organizer. I mean, you put in data into the organizer, but it's, it's very sporadic. It's, most of the data entry actually done on most Palm Pilots or most visors is on the keyboard on your desktop um, and or transferring information on your desktop that's already in there. So, um, but here, the messaging applications were, were a key driver behind this device, both email and instant messaging. We felt that was the future of them, and we wanted a keyboard. Interestingly enough, the more you use it, the more you realize it's also absolutely critical for, for the phone functionality. And um, so having, you know, we've embedded a kind of 10 key pad into this. Um, you can navigate around this device very easily, and we've kind of, I think, um, Jeff and the team have changed the way people are going to dial phones in the future because today it, it is kind of silly that we all, all uh, when we think of dialing somebody, we don't think of dialing them, we think of dialing some number. Um, and why wouldn't I just dial their name? 
right? And so on this device, you actually just start entering their name, and it goes through my 1,500 names, and in three keystrokes, not 10, which might be their number, but three keystrokes, it gets me one of 1,500 people, and I can immediately dial their number. And I don't have to think about their numbers anymore, which is kind of a fundamental breakthrough when you think about it. So um, that's that's why the keyboard's there. It uh, really will uh, change the way. I'll, it's going I'll address the second question, which is why you know how is it bug free? And we have a really we had a really talented uh, team of engineers, some of them here tonight, uh, and they deserve credit for that. Uh, I, I'd like to just call out one person. I think it was Roger Flores. I think was here tonight. Um, and Roger, correct me if I'm wrong, but he created this thing called Gremlins. Well, which is really great. And Gremlins is this automated sort of monkey typing at the keyboard type of thing. You know, you know, they say how monkeys, how many monkeys would it take for a million years to type, you know, Shakespeare or something. Well, what Gremlins does, it runs all the time and throws what we technically call events, which are events are pen downs and movements and key presses and and so on. It throws randomly throws events at the machine as fast as it possibly can, essentially doing the most random things you could possibly do. And what happens, you, the trick is to see how many millions of gremlin events you can run before the machine crashes. Because what happens when it runs overnight, it ends up filling up every database. It ends up filling up every cre you know, crevice of memory. It ends up changing every feature in every way, in possible imagined ways. And, and, and you know, it, gremlins can break practically anything. Um, and, and but you know we would test it over and over again, and the idea was you know could you get to a million gremlins? Uh, uh, and th I think I it was a really great innovation, and, and um, I think if it was Roger, I hope it was Roger. That he, should Roger. he should get he's, credit. He's nodding. He's got credit for that. Uh, I was interested in what's the uh, normal range of typing speed for uh, for the uh, keyboard, the BlackBerry equivalent kind, versus the graffiti kind. Um, and what's the fastest range? I, I love doing the graffiti thing, and people are always looking at me going, boy, you're really fast to that. And I'm only doing about 25 words a minute, maybe, or something. So I was just interested to hear. And also, have you all looked at Doug Engelbart's uh, five-chord key thing that uh, is kind of a brilliant, unusual uh, uh, keyboard solution you also? You wouldn't believe how many alternate text entry mechanisms I've looked at over the years. Um, it's incredible the number of people who still call us and send me says I have invented the next wave and I'm not sure if, I don't know if I know Doug Engelbert but I've looked at other corded key, key things and we've tried them all out. Um, the problem is you know even if they might be slightly maybe the questionably better or not you know you, you don't want to change something out unless it's a lot better. Uh, to your first part of the question, I don't think we've ever had a contest on uh, entering Who's tech. the fastest? Yeah. Who's the fastest? I think it would vary person to person. Some people yeah. love graffiti. There's some people who never could use graffiti and, and wanted the keyboard. I, I think what's one of the interesting little stories here is that we decided to do the keyboard, and then we decided we better test that. So another one of Ed's tests, and we go in and we, we show the keyboard, and, and literally half the people who came in said, you know, that, that's intimidating. That's scary. I, I want my graffiti. I, I like graffiti, which was funny for us since, you know, we had had all these times where people told us nobody's going to learn to write, you know, graffiti's never going to succeed, why would anybody do that? And now we're having these people come in and tell us, you know, how can you take my graffiti away, you know, why would you force me to change this keyboard? So, since it was such a strong reaction in the focus groups, um, that was why we added the graffiti version and said, okay, let's see, let's give people an option, let's see what they select, let's see how they do with it. So. I think, you know, we've just started shipping trio. We're going to learn a lot more over um, the next couple of weeks and a couple of months to see how do people really like them differently, particularly when you're using a device in a different way, like Ed described as a communicator. But all of us who, you know, we've become quite good at graffiti, as you can imagine. And, um, and pretty I know, much I know every, all the punctuation. I, <laughs> I know a lot of the symbols. Um, that's what it's like working with. And, and, um, and what you, what you find is that when you start using this product, you very quickly realize that the keyboard is just a lot better method of entering the information. And it's just faster. It is faster. There's no question I, I, in my yeah. mind that it's faster. But we, um, we, we don't want to tell people what they should do. Um, but we, we, we believe as the products become phones and the product becomes messaging and email focused that uh, the keyboard is, it will be the dominant solution. I actually uh, made a prediction when we shipped the trio that I think well over 50% of the, all cell phones will have a QWERTY keyboard on them in a few years. It is, it is that important. Um, I think it's going to happen. So, so ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of this team? <laughs> And there's, a, and there's a lot of people out in the audience that really was part of that team. If they want to stand up that worked on the, the bomb, please, please do so. Yeah, all calm and handspring. Please, everybody stand calm, handspring. Hand the competitors, all of you really deserve credit for it.
that has really made a difference in computing and the way we think about computing. <laughs> and I think the last bit of comment is you can see these people have fun. It's, it's a fun deal thinking about the future. Most of them. Most of the time. <laughs> and we have just as, a, as a, a little bit of a present on behalf of the Computer History Museum, Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Now you're really famous. And let me let me draw this to a close and I want to thank everyone for attending. There's some, some books over here. Um, on the Palm Pilot story that is uh, still available. And uh, the speakers will be around for a few more moments, I believe, to answer some questions if you want. And uh, thank you all for coming. Okay.